In the middle of March of this year, several hospitals were overwhelmed with COVID-19 patients. Most of the ERs in these top hospitals were inundated by critically ill COVID-19 suspects. They needed help and all pointed to the director of the largest medical center in the Philippines to help out. The Philippine General Hospital is a teaching hospital under the University of the Philippines. It took up the big challenge to help out the nation and become a COVID-19 referral hospital. Today, we will listen to the stories behind the making of UPPGH as a leading COVID-19 referral hospital in the national capital region and the Philippines. Welcome to TVUP Health Issues, and this is your host, Dr. Teddy Herbosa. Our guest today is the best Filipino surgeon clinically and academically. He is a graduate of the UP College of Medicine and uh, took his residency at the, of neurosurgery at the UP PGH. He had been president of the Academy of Filipino Neurosurgeons and the Asian Association of Neurosurgeons. He was also a former medalist of the UAAP UP track and field team in uh, running in the event 400 meter low hurdle. He is a skilled saxophonist, but most importantly, he is the current director of the largest teaching hospital of the Philippines, the UP Philippine General Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Gap Ligaspi, to the to to this particular episode of Health Issues. Gap. Hi, Ted. Good afternoon. I'm happy to be here. It's my honor to be um, sharing our experience here in the Philippine General Hospital. So let's talk about it directly. And uh, give me the story behind how UPPGH became a COVID-19 referral hospital. Um, well, I think it's, it's, uh, it started when we started reading the signs. So, um, our ERs being swamped by uh, uh, people with upper respiratory tract uh, symptoms, uh, what we call regularly in the ER as a uh, severe uh, um, acute respiratory illness, or SARI. And um, that was the time, middle of March, when the uh, COVID uh, uh, pandemic was uh, uh, getting out of hand. And it was reflected mainly in the private hospitals as an overwhelming uh, overcapacity of their emergency rooms, their ICUs. So if you read that, it was a matter of time before it got to the, to the um, government hospitals, uh, mainly because the first wave was from people who traveled abroad and the probably well off people who went to private hospitals. So we were assessing the situation and um, we uh, thought that this is a matter of time before as government hospitals got uh, overwhelmed themselves. So I got to talk to some of the uh, directors of the government hospitals, the DOH hospitals, and I got to talk to the directors of the uh, private hospitals and we were all in agreement that uh, maybe the Wuhan uh, formula where they built a mega hospital of 1,000 plus beds uh, might be what we needed at that point. Because right. we needed to save a health system, hospital system. No? We cannot let all of these hospitals fall down at the same time because of overcapacity. So Correct. Uh, we, had, we had a meeting and I brought it up with the uh, uh, special assistant to the Secretary of Health uh, who eventually uh, set up a meeting with the, the Secretary and uh, we explained the concept itself. And um, I ended up talking to the uh, uh, technical advisory group the next day, who already was also thinking about it. Um, and in fact, when I got to the table with them, that was March 19, they already um, uh, had the idea of uh, uh, assigning PGH, Jose N. Rodriguez Hospital Memorial Hospital, and Lung Center as the exclusive COVID referral centers. So that's around... I, I uh, met the secretary March 18. I met the technical advisory group March 19, and I met the uh, field implementation uh, uh, team of the the DOH and CR uh, um, hospitals also on March 19. And that's when finally um, we were uh, uh, all three were assigned uh, different quadrants uh, of the Metro Manila. 
we had the biggest uh, uh, coverage because we committed 130 beds, mm -hmm. scale up to 200. And so we got the southwestern part. So that's Las Piñas, Paranaque, Pasay, Mandaluyong, Makati, Manila, and parts of Taguig and San Juan. So that's okay. quite a big area. Um, so that's how it ended up. Um, but uh, <clears throat> coming out of that meeting, uh, coming out of that meeting, uh, I thought uh, you know um, uh, it will only it will be probably we could probably do our work better if four conditions were were uh, agreed on. One, there should be full support from uh, of financial um, uh, funding of funding from uh, the DOH. Number two, there should be manpower augmentation. Number three, there should be um, uh, a a good referral system to take the non-COVID patients from those hospitals. And number four, a command center. Luckily for us, three of the four were instantly given, and the fourth was, we worked on the fourth one in the coming uh, weeks. We just yes. command so, so those are the next questions I'd like to find out. What were the uh, engineering repairs to convert the Philippine General Hospital into a COVID hospital and uh, repair and uh, creation of a command center uh, as you uh, uh, described yes so again going back to the wuhan uh, manual uh, they believe that a negative pressure uh, environment made their infection rate really low uh, for their health workers they have a, uh, a surprisingly low uh, infection rate i mean compared to the initial phase uh, of course the first part they had uh, quite a number Okay. So, but that's impossible no, in the wards of PG because of uh, the turn of the century design, high ceiling, big windows. So we employed three groups of uh, engineers and architects, a, a hospital architect, engineering uh, expert, and UP experts as well, UP engineering experts as well. And they all agreed that the natural ventilation will uh, also work as long as the air exchange is, um, is ensured. So what we did was we blew air into the ward. It's a long, um, 200, uh, 100 meter long ward. Uh, we blew air into the ward. Uh, we um, uh, sucked in air from one side with the ex reverse exhaust fans. Mm -hmm. And then we blew out air onto the other side with the regular exhaust fans. So, uh, and then we turned on the electric fans from the ceiling. So you can now imagine a net effect of are going in one direction so uh, so in, in institution sometimes some kind of a positive pressure so that the air doesn't stay within that particular so, water yes. so it's a it's the air exchange that was uh for the uh key to that in fact uh, there's a who manual that supports that actually the who uh, yes. uh article that supports that saying that good ventilation is even better than the PPE. Uh, that's what they were saying. And, uh, enclosed, and the enclosed space, right? In uh, enclosed yes. spaces that reported yeah. high incidence of uh, healthcare yeah. work in such so, so what were uh, the other the things, command, aside from creating those designs? Uh, the you command need to center. buy equipment? Ah, the command center, okay. Oh, the command center. The command about, center? Okay, so that's where the system comes in. I think we were just lucky that the president had the uh, foresight to create a command center because uh, around that time also we were uh, uh, asking for a lot of help uh, both from the government and private and it was quite overwhelming at some time so the president uh, uh, asked uh, Chancellor uh, Menchit Padilla, the UP Manila Chancellor, to create some sort of a call center that will function as one a um, donations coordination center and two as a patient um, uh, communication center. I mean, patient as so like a like COVID. a call center, like a call center um, uh, with uh, multiple purposes. So we had that. We use that to communicate with patients and communicate with uh, other centers as well. And I think that communication center uh, helped not. Uh plug up the ER of the PGH. The idea was that the doctors could talk to them and tell them if they should go to the hospital or they should stay at home yes. and just uh, wait it out, right? Yes. Remember at that time, the uh, DOH, uh, the DOH uh, uh, mandate on us was to send the mild PUIs home. 
Yeah, so, yeah that so was the whole protocol. They were advised to not to come here anymore. That really helped a lot because we were not swamped with the PUIs. Correct, correct. How about in terms of uh, equipment, uh, PPE and supplies, uh, ventilators, PPE, okay. and equipment? What, what equipment was needed to stockpile, to, to be stockpiled to be a COVID-19 hospital? Okay, so based on our estimates, if we had 130 beds, 30% 30 of that will become critical. So right. we were thinking that maybe uh, 100 beds of regular ward and 30 beds of ICU. We actually had around uh, 22 uh, high-end Puritan Bennett respirators, but we were able to acquire uh, 10 more uh, of the same okay. nature. And then on standby, actually 12 more. And then on standby, we um, uh, uh, kept our uh, private uh, uh, partners in uh, outsource uh, respirator um, supply, res uh, extra line, okay. on standby with 30 respirators and uh, corresponding okay. respiratory therapists. So I think one of the things that uh, uh, was really made the difference also was the high flow O2 nasal cannula. Correct. Because at a so certain a new device, a new device. Yes. Right? A certain point, uh, the belief of early intubation turn around to late intubation, yeah. and the, the high flow O2 nasal cannula help in uh, preventing a lot of uh, you know, uh, patients from being intubated. Of course, we we bought um, monitors, oximeters, we bought um, um, uh, equipment uh, to. Uh, uh, move patients around, uh, transport ventilators, and of course, millions and millions of pesos worth of PPE. So, so, um, so how, how, what was your utilization of PPEs at the height of uh, COVID patients? How many PPEs did you need in a day? So for the 130 beds, <coughs> it was initially estimated that we probably would have needed uh, uh, 3,400 3, uh uh, 1,800 a day um, for the 130 patients if they were uh, in single rooms. But because we put them in cohorts, in the wards, uh, 22 per ward at uh, six, six feet apart, we were able to bring down our PPE consumption to 600 to 700 a day. So we were able to save uh, at least three times of the, what we would have uh, needed. And our, okay. um, when before declaring us open, we said that we will not open unless we had at least one month supply of PPE. So Stockpile. we had a one month rolling stock. Okay. Yes, uh, we had at least 20,000 PPEs, N95s, uh, goggles, and that. so only then when we declared um, uh, the wards open on uh, March 30. We started preparing uh, March 22. Yeah, I see. So I, I, I know that in the beginning, there was a lot of uproar in social media. Uh, several of our own doctors and healthcare workers weren't in agreement with your idea of becoming a COVID-19 hospital. So they were ranting on social media about why PGA should be the COVID hospital. How did you handle this dissent from our own uh, specialists and our own uh, healthcare workers in PGH? So I think uh, uh, the uh, the concerns were quite um, uh, valid because you know we were serving a thousand five hundred patients uh, a day, I mean, a, a day in the hospital, and uh, they were thinking that we became COVID hospital. All of these services would be gone. Yes, now actually they 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 were affected, but. My reading of the situation at that time is even if we did not become a COVID hospital, we would have lost those patients because it was ECQ. The OPD was true. Closed. True. Uh, right. We were banned from doing elective surgeries. So right. and then the the, the ER uh, was patients were weren't going to the ER because of the PUIs. No? So yeah, the, the people the were scared to go to a hospital. Decreasing. Yes, the right. numbers are actually decreasing already. You know, and in fact, at right. one point, the private hospitals had the had the twenty percent of their their uh, admissions already. So, even if we did not become a COVID hospital, we would have lost our patients, and we would have been swamped by with COVID patients. 
because we were the big government hospital that people will probably go to. So the other one, of course, is the fear, the fear of, uh, of COVID. And uh, because of all the doctors who passed away, uh, you know, our friends. Correct, our colleagues uh, and friends. So it was managing the fear, really, that uh, uh, probably was the first step. And I think the fear could be was managed by um, you know, telling them that we had the systems in place. Our HIKU uh, gave information campaign. Our um, our um, PPE supply, as I said, was one month, and it was our mm -hmm. PPE level was 0.5 to one on top of WHO recommendation. I think. Wow. <laughs> we were ex and we I were saw and I saw, of course, your uh, official letter to the PGH community. <laughs> Yeah, and so, joining them and you know rallying the troops that this is yeah. part of national uh, so, endeavor yeah. nationalism to help out our country so that so, was a struggle that was an obstacle right uh, it was an obstacle sure that there was a buy-in yeah so i think the the most important thing is there were people who eventually uh you know um heeded the call um well when we were organizing it of course you no know, you cannot help but doubt if you made the right decision but mm -hmm. the one of the uh, one of the crisis team uh, members said, "Yo, oh, magaling ang mga taga ang advantage natin sa PGH sabi niya. Magaling ang mga taga PGH. <laughs> hindi yan hindi yan mapapayag <laughs> na masasama ang pangalan natin. And true na after the initial fear uh, and uh, it was uh, the fear was tempered by the PPEs, uh, the the hotels that they were staying on in, the buses that were provided right. to them." The food that they were getting, eventually, um, they were making suggestions already on how to make it work. But of course, wow. uh, those who stayed home probably will not feel the same involvement. Uh, uh, that's why, even as it was going on, it was, you know, it was really difficult to um, temper the expectations of our other members. But two months down the line, I think. Um, uh, the problem is not the COVID ward anymore. The problem is how to get back to uh, how we were before Correct. working on that. Uh, so you had the setup already. You had the engineering. You had the uh, equipment. You had the command center. You had convinced the people to open up. What was next? The next was uh, to make the necessary guidelines, protocols, and training. Uh, tell me more about how you did that. How did you train people? How to don and doff the PPE? Uh, yeah. uh, you know how to enter and avoid places that are COVID part of the hospital, etc. How yeah. was that done? The training and the protocols. So, like like in true UP fashion, when you do something, you try to do the best, right? So you wanted right. to be the best, uh, had the best system in all of this. So one was we had a very good uh, uh, hospital infection infection control unit headed by Dr. Nina Berba, and. Um, we uh, relied on uh, her because she is a well-written researcher. Uh, she's, uh, she makes uh, decisions based on evidence. And I think uh, people respect her when uh, she talks about these protocols. So <clears throat> the way we did uh, spread out the protocols is by having an information education uh, committee headed okay. by Dr. Rappe with very attractive uh, infographics and I think uh, regular communication was done through here because no one was in the hospital no you just got through them through uh, facebook or viber um so there was a regular progressive uh, uh instruction uh, uh campaign on how to uh, uh don and doff uh, there were actual there were actual uh, donning and doffing uh, courses given by nurses and residents and um and to make it even safer i think uh, the in, the uh, positioning of a safety officer in the donning area that makes sure that all the steps are taken just like a, a, a flying an airplane you cannot fly until all the steps are checked so right. that was one of the safety measures number two we allowed them to change because we know we're all, all only humans we allowed them four hours of uh, break uh, yeah. because in Wuhan also they found this really um, useful in uh, uh, maintaining uh, well-being of the uh, nurses, of the staff, uh, and also um, per, uh, maintaining performance level. But uh, lo and behold, most of them decided to stay for eight hours in the same PPE. 
maybe wow. to help us sleep. Oh yes, and some of them even wore diapers because they didn't want to take oh. out the PP. Oh, yeah. I see. Yes, yes, yes. For eight so, hours. That's right. So the way to make it safe, yes. Yeah. So the way to make it safe is they entered only in one area and exited in another. So they never went back the same door to doff to remove the PPE. So after they get infected, they they only move in one direction towards the other end of the pavilion where the doffing station is. But before they get out of the door to be uh, assisted by another safety officer, they go through a nano mist tent that uh, uh -huh. for 30 seconds they're sprayed with the isopropyl alcohol. Uh, it's still in full gear and um, hoping, hoping to decrease the viral load on the surface of the uh, PPEs. And then they doff. And then they go straight to a shower that was built at the uh, entrance of Ward 3. So they shower right after doffing. So, so the, the, I guess, life and then, the, yes. the life of the uh, healthcare worker totally changed. The behavior, the practice on yeah. uh, how to care for yeah, patients yeah. totally changed. Yeah, so there, there were people who painted, uh, there were people who, uh, you know, um, uh, panic as soon as they put on the N95 mask because it's hard to breathe, you know. And then Correct. we had initially we had um, uh, blisters on the face uh, because of the N95. Yes. Good thing that a lot of the city officers are dermatologists, so they got instant, uh, <laughs> got instant uh, consultation and intervention there. So I guess yeah, the I other that ways that we, yeah, the other ways that we made it safe as we, I think one, we're one of the few hospitals to do fit testing of face masks. Of mm -hmm. rest of the 95K. So what is the fit test? Uh, can you describe to us what the <coughs> fit test so, is all about? So you uh, you choose a mask that is uh, comfortable to your face. Let's say an N95 8210 model. You put it on your face, you mold it. They put a hood on top of it, on your head. It's like a like a very much like like with our kids, we put a plastic uh, plastic uh, bag on our head. But this one had the clear uh, shield. And it had a hole near the mouth, and the bitter uh, solution was uh, aerosol was sprayed inside that hood. And you start breathing deeply, you start turning your head, chewing, moving your lips. If you feel any bitter taste inside, that means there's a leak. That's a leak. So that test, uh, it's not a good fit. That mask is not a good fit. And that's a good fit. So only when you don't taste the bitter uh, taste anymore, then that's your mask. Then so you keep that mask. to be a weak sound, supply uh, of that. Yeah. Okay. So that's very that's. Good, I think um, that that also lessens the um, um, infection rate. So, infection rate. So By the way, the how other, many of the, uh, the other, healthcare workers have been infected? How many have been infected so far? Of the total number caring at the PGH. So for those who work, so yes, for those who work in the COVID ward, and there are one thousand fifty of them. Uh, around 24 uh, healthcare workers have, have been infected already. So that's around 2%, 2 2.1%. 2 yeah. And uh, 2%. The whole, yeah, for the whole hospital, uh, around 4%, 4.5%. So meaning more, more uh, healthcare workers were getting infected outside of the COVID ward in the community rather than the COVID ward itself. How so about the, when uh, we investigated, they will eat. Yeah, you did also something different uh, in terms of duty of the healthcare worker. I think you okay. changed the, the usual duty mode to get yes. the incubation period and exposure. Can you describe that to, to our viewers? So when, the, when we didn't know exactly how the infection will get into the hospital because we were still open at that time, very porous, and uh, MEQ was declared, uh, ECQ was declared. Um, we adopted a one week on, two weeks off duty uh, schedule uh, for two reasons. One, you decrease the personnel that are in the hospital, so just in case you get someone to spread something, you have one third of the workforce only in the hospital, and two thirds are can uh, substitute the one third that will get sick. So that's the first one reason uh, for doing that. The second one is if they go on duty and they somehow get infected, 
and they feel the symptoms, at least they have the two weeks to rest uh, to uh, be relieved of the symptom. And hopefully, um, uh, days after that, they'll be able to go back to work again once tested negative. So that's the reason why we uh, introduced the one week on, two weeks off. Uh, of course, the other ones, for them to rest. And this was really very new to them. They can barely move during their duty. They, uh, they were suffering from um, um, heat and exhaustion. So they were given a longer time to recover. So how about the uh, Bayanihan Center? That was the command center, right? The, the, it eventually called the yes. UP Manila Bayan. Can you describe to me where it is? Uh, who manned it? Who were the people there? What type of transactions happened in the Bayanihan Center? So it's just quite interesting also because uh, the chancellor set it up like a professional call center. So you have 20 computers there with 20 interns who volunteered. Uh, so there's some medical know-how. Um, so people will call uh, for two reasons, I said. Um, uh, uh, there were scripts that she wrote uh, to answer almost all types of queries so that it's all um, consistent um, and very professional. So they will ask on how to, do, how to proceed with the donation. Uh, so they were given instructions on that. Um, so they went on 24-hour duties um, for that. So we got a lot of donations from there, uh, going through there. And also they were given uh, scripts on how to answer medical questions um, from uh, patients or patients' families. Those that they cannot answer um, at their level are referred to consultants or to the services on duty. Yeah. So they, they are so it was really like a call center. Yes. It was operating like our, a call center for medical. Yes, yes. So now and, uh, uh, it was also the place to give donations, right? Because people it, wanted to help. Yes, it was in the nurses' home. Uh, that is the 1938 Thomas Mapua building uh, in, okay. um, in the northern part of the uh, hospital, uh, where the store, the huge uh, social hall house all the donations. Uh, that were uh, gathered by this group. So now it's evolving. That it's evolving to our portal for the telemedicine oh. of, uh, of PGH. So uh, that, actually, that was my next question to you. Uh, how <laughs> did telemedicine help uh, the treatment or how the the safety and treatment of COVID nineteen patients? How does telemedicine work? Okay. Well. I was going to say telemedicine in terms of continuing outpatient care for our patients who cannot come to PGH anymore. So the Bayanian Center is one portal of getting your doctor or an appointment to the clinic. But as far as telemedicine is concerned, I think you saw in the uh, some of our infographics or our announcements that uh, our um, in-house uh, Masters in computer science, Doctor Doctor Homer Co. De developed yes. uh, one a, a telecomustahan module where the a laptop is wheeled to the patient and he starts talking right. to his um, relative via Zoom, and yeah. that was really very effective. And uh, you know the social workers cried with the patient; <laughs> they were crying. Um, yeah. The other one is he created an EMR that for. Okay. For uh, so for that the, COVID the doctors that have to go, in. yeah, so they don't have to go into the ward and write the order. So they he develop an EMR uh, outside the the wards. And number three, um, our um, uh, Seabol group, um, Doctor Ewang, and uh, the orthopedics group, they develop a um, a. Um, an iPad-based uh, telehealth uh, module where they wheel in an iPad on a, on a um, uh, tripod into the patient in the ICU with the pulmonologist or the intensive care specialist outside the ICU. Now, you remember our ICU doesn't have a window where we can Correct. peek through and see our patients. So the, the iPad um, camera afforded the uh, uh, internist or the pulmonologist outside the uh, ICU to see the monitors, the patient themselves. Uh, if the mask, they were using the, the venti mask, the snorkeling mask, yeah. it, it, was fit, it was fitted well. 
if needed an adjustment. So those are the things that uh, how telemedicine was used also. Yeah, that's uh, of course. Uh, when we take an X-ray, we don't have to wait for the film anymore. <laughs> so it's uh -huh. there, we can view it already. Yeah. Actually, that's what the patients who recover say. They never recognize the face of the people, the nurses and the doctors that took care of them because they're all wearing PPE and uh, face mask and uh, goggles. So they don't recognize who took care of them. Plus, yeah. they are all isolated from their relatives. And this yes. uh, telemedicine portal allowed them to communicate with the Yes, relatives the telecom was done, I think, was really very ingenious for of Dr. Homerko to uh, come up with it also. Yeah, it's, that's uh, innovations being put out by our doctors at the uh, Philippine General Hospital on uh, for better care, no? Better yeah, quality yeah, of care yeah. with the patients. So, what are your learning points in this endeavor? I think you're the only PGH director that uh, faced the pandemic. <laughs> this will go down <laughs> in history. So, why don't you tell us what are your uh, in introspection? What are the things you learned about this? Uh, very unique experience of running a COVID <laughs> referral hospital for the Philippines. Okay. I guess, um, first, I think some of the first pitfall was uh, uh, the com lack of communications. I think communication is really key. I think that was why a lot of the uh, alumni and our faculty were also uh, uh, you know, ranting about it because uh, we didn't have time to communicate. We had one week to uh, set it up so how can i meet all of them or and i i refuse to explain anything on facebook so i was banking on the on the chairs and on my fellow alumni to explain to them so communication is still key and uh, we found out that um you know no matter how distinct the departments are uh, given the the given the challenge they they rise up to it we um um i think uh, uh, being uh, uh, mindful of statistics, of reading the signs, mm -hmm. uh, helps you with that. Helps you this, make the right decisions is very important also. So uh, having uh, very uh, well researched ideas um, makes helps makes uh, right decision for a, a decision maker like uh, like a director. Uh, I, the other one is. Um, um, we, re we realize that uh, no one is indispensable. For those who mm -hmm. want to help us, we just look for another one who, who can do the same yes. job. Uh, so people didn't come, nurses didn't come, doctors didn't come, so there's someone who's going to replace them. And, and I think uh, uh, in that case, uh, the DOH volunteers given by the Department of Health really helped a lot. There are 130 of them that they were given to us. Um, in, you know, if our organization, the crisis committee was created outside of the director's advisory board. Right. It's all okay. surgeons, Ed. It's all surgeons. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, our surgeons are designed for crisis intervention. Uh -huh. That's what was my mentor said. You're, you've been trained all your life to solve problems. Solve yeah. these problems. <laughs> so they were your problem solvers, right? This is the situation. Uh, surgical team. There was no organizational chart. No, there were just four okay. people uh, that I talked to. I told them, do what you need to do. And that, uh, you know, that, uh, it is proof that uh, it is the people who really work and not the committee. So you just choose the right people and they, they, they did a fantastic job. Dennis Serrano on, uh, on the... Yes. the donations, the donations, uh, logistics. On, yeah. you know, on manpower. And you know, it's so easy. Power. I just told them, anything that moves, Rodney will take care of that. <laughs> anything that does not move. So equipment, <laughs> and equipment, and yeah. manpower, uh, human yeah. resources, and manpower. If they need to travel, Wonderful. yes, that's it. That's a man on a bicycle, that's Rodney. And Boko okay. Campo put all the flows together. Flow, the, the system. Okay. Boko Campo. Well, yeah. That's wonderful. Those are interesting golden nuggets. I do hope you will write that in a big book one time and become <laughs> the playbook of how to convert a big uh, teaching hospital into a... Uh, uh, COVID referral hospital. Uh, question, when are you returning to the new normal? When will yeah. we start doing elective surgery? When will we uh, start admitting the other critically ill patients that PGH uh, caters to? Okay. Again, Ted, as I said, you have to read the signs. So, so when they say they're going to leave the uh, modified ECQ on, uh, on the 31st, 
you cannot admit everyone on the first. We all know that a second search is really possible. Yes. Uh, um, so my initial gut feel was it's going to be bad, but I think right now, uh, because of the testing, we're able to handle the PUIs better. So uh -huh. confidently, I this afternoon or just before coming to this interview, we just finished the director's advisory board, and we agreed mm -hmm. that June one we'll start uh, piloting our system. We changed everything. That there are no more departments in PGH, only service <laughs> wards. So there's a Wonderful. surgical service. And a medical service. So they agree who comes in for surgery first. Malignant tumors over benign, non-deferrable or deferrable, um, non-blood uh, requiring versus blood requiring, yeah. or, or those that Gap, you require. You've been able to do what no other PGH director has <laughs> done to break the silos. Yeah. To break the silos of the different specialties. They're in the talking. hospital, and, yes. and they now talk and work together as one. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah. So it's really, it's really, you know, when when as a director, uh, when I saw all the problems of PGH, uh, maybe in the middle of my uh, directorship, I said the only way that we can solve PGH problem is if we reboot PGH. I think this is the rebooting <laughs> of PGH. <laughs> this is the rebooting. Like, it's like so, turning off final words, Gap. Yeah. Well, the final, final word. word uh, talk, talk me, tell me about uh, how PGH will be in the new normal. I mean, you've discussed some of it already with this okay. uh, uh, the removing of the departments, etc. Yes. Uh, what will happen to training? What will happen to research? What will happen to patients? What will okay. be the new normal like for Philippine General Hospital? Okay, the new normal life is there will be less patients, I think, because of the physical distancing until you know it's it's the vaccine comes in. So we reduce everything at least by 50%. Hoping if we get the 60% uh, 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 resumption, I'll be happy with that. So the key is to remove the COVID patients from the wards. So we're building a 40 uh, bed ideal isolation unit so that we put all the COVID wards there. The operating room is going to be in the outpatient department. So they're all outside the main building. So we plan to resume a COVID-free Philippine General Hospital. So that's a thing. So what we foresee is that we become what we've always dreamed that to be a truly tertiary center. We only take in those who will need robotic surgery, interventional cardiology, uh, interventional radiology, uh, stenting, coiling, no? and leave the cholecystectomies and appendectomies and the pneumonias and the diarrheas to second uh, other hospitals that will uh, be able to handle them. So the new normal will be a higher level um, uh, mm -hmm. number of cases. We, our residents will have to go out to train the basic and come back here to finish off with the advanced training. As of now, were, I'm looking at this as to uh, our, uh, uh, finally our uh, primary healthcare uh, uh, program to take off because we will be forced to send our internal medicine and family med uh, doctors to the community, to the to the areas, to the people who cannot come to PGH anymore because they they are not tertiary care requiring. So well, that's right. Thank you very much, Doctor Gap. I think uh, I envy your position. You are in a position like uh, uh, the captain of a big battle, the general of a big battle in a. That is historical. Congratulations on your victories. And I do hope that you've learned a lot and that you can share that wisdom to the rest of the medical community and other uh, hospital administrators. Maraming maraming salamat, Dr. Legaski. Say hello ako na tuto, Ted. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. With that, thank ladies you, thank and you. gentlemen, thank you. We'd like to thank Director Gap Legaski for his surge in terms of his uh, volunteerism to lead the Philippine General Hospital from a university teaching hospital to the leading COVID referral hospital in the Philippines. There were many lessons learned. He described all of them, some golden nuggets of advice and wisdom. And with all of that, we bid you all thank you for listening to us. We do hope that uh, you will support the Philippine General Hospital and all the doctors and health wor healthcare workers that uh, sacrifice there and show their heroism. Maraming salamat. This is Dr. Tedder Bosa for TV UP Health Issues. Goodbye and thank you very much. <laughs>